Deep listening. الاستماع العميق. Deep listening. Intensive to hear. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Impact beyond words. Let's go with uh, deep listening from Scotland all the way down to Wales. Scotland would be deep listening. And then, say, in Northern English would be more deep listening. London would be deep listening. And then a more refined lens would be more, full, more refined would be deep listening. When I teach the accent, I go through a breakdown and I talk about the placement, meaning where the accent lives in the mouth, the oral posture, how the different articulators, lips, tongue, teeth, how the jaw works in this accent to shape sound. The specific sound changes. So like I was talking about before, how I say so and how Oscar says so, those differences. And then the rhythm and intonation and stress pattern of the accent. And then as we go through the show or I work with the actor in their session, I pay attention and give notes on those elements and how they're contributing to or hindering the comprehension and the acting. Sammy, just educate me. Talk, talk sure. me through what's happened to your sight. Yes. Yeah, so my main issue is glaucoma. Mm. Um, which is degenerative. So I've always been visually impaired. That's always been part of my identity for as long as I can remember. Um, but I have had much more sight than I do now. And right now I'm not completely blind, but it is very possible that I will um, become completely blind at some point in my life. In this episode of Deep Listening Impact Beyond Words, we travel to Chicago to meet Sammy, a voice coach. She takes us through her high school days where her teacher in theatre, Mr. Thompson, taught her her most powerful lesson about how to listen beyond the words and how to listen for meaning. Mr. Thompson, the cool teacher, the one everybody paid attention to, but not because he was good looking, just because he listened beyond the obvious. Listen out in this interview as we hear about the role of breathing. We hear about the role of comprehension and we hear about the role of authenticity in helping you to listen better. Sammy provides a great insight into how to have fun with accents. And you'll listen out as she just drops into a Pakistani accent, an Indian accent, a Glaswegian accent, a North London accent. She's amazing. It's a fun interview and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Let's listen to Sammy. Deep listening. Écoute attentive. Bene ascoltare. Ukulalela fieleja. Sammy, starting off the dinner table, what's your memories of the dinner table and what was your kind of favorite meal there and in your family? Who was the best listener? That's a very interesting question for me because we didn't really have traditional family dinners. Neither of my parents cooked um, with like almost ever. My mom would occasionally, maybe once a month, every two months, cook a nice meal for the family and then we would sit down. But for the most part, it was sporadic. We would often have multiple um, different takeout restaurants um, at the house um, that people were eating. Um, and so we would rarely eat together. And um, especially as we grew older, my, my had a brother who's two years older than me. He and I had very different schedules in terms of our extracurriculars. So we went off and eat together. And then when I was 13, um, my mom had another baby. Um, and so that really shifted everything as well, because all of a sudden, um, everything was focused on her. Um, and so family dinners still weren't really a huge affair because it was, you know, the baby ate at a certain time. And then my mom kind of ate whatever she could and, um, all that. And, um, yeah. So, uh, if, and when we would sit down together, all five of us, so this is now when my sister's in the picture, um, I would have to say, and this is going to sound really obnoxious, but the best listener would be me. Um, because I think that's just a natural inclination of mine to listen and take in information, and I have a really excellent memory. As you moved into your schooling days, uh, was there a teacher or another student that was a really great example of listening for you? Yes, my sophomore English teacher 
was also um, also taught a speech class, and he also ran the speech and drama team, which um, sometimes is also called forensics teams, which has nothing to do with like forensics, you know, police work. But um, I don't know why it's called that. But um, it's where we like prepare different types of speeches. So sometimes it's an actual written speech. Sometimes it's an original speech written by us. And I would do more dramatic events um, because I went was an actor. And so I would do like a play cut into six minutes where I'd play multiple characters. And that teacher ran that program as well. And he was um, the first person who I think I took note was an excellent listener because he had this really confident, calm air um, and had control over the classroom without working at it. You know, so many teachers feel they have to get control through yelling or through being intimidating. And he was just, you know, he was very confident and cool. <laughs> like He was a cool teacher without being like a super young hippie teacher because um, he was a kind of an older guy. Um, and he would listen to teenagers and whatever babble we had to say. Um, and I think part of that was because he ran an extracurricular activity. So he, you know, um, was with us outside of a classroom setting where we were getting a grade. Um, but I remember that he would really relate to teenagers and would really listen to what they had to say, um, as opposed to just be there to talk at them. His name is Mr. Thompson. When I was in school, um, mostly in high school, not as much in college, I would record classes and then take notes later because at that time I wasn't really using a computer on my own. It was sort of in that transitional period where some people had computers, some people didn't. Um, and so I would take, I would record classes and then take the notes at home. So I would listen to my classes twice. Um, <clears throat> and I, many, many years after high school, this is probably, uh, I want to say four years ago. So when I would have been 23, I was going through my bedroom at home and my parents' house and found a tape from an old class that I had of his and listening back and me listening to myself as a teenager is extremely painful because I feel I was a very um, kind of obnoxious teenager. While being a good listener, I was also a very loud talker um, <laughs> and kind of uh, in people's face about it because I was sort of overcompensating for my severe lack of confidence. Um, and I remember listening to that tape and I was, I don't even remember specifically what I said, but I was talking about some girl who was coming to visit the school who had been in our class but transferred and I was just like prattling on about this girl and Mr. Thompson was listening to every word I was saying and saying, oh yeah, I heard she was coming and oh, that's so nice. I hope I get to see her as opposed to being like, you know, just brushing me off and saying, yeah, 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 I heard. Where I think some other teachers might not have, has, um, might not have been as receptive to my teenage prattle. Deep listening. Deep listening. Tiefes Zuhören. Deep listening. When did you start to notice differences in voices? Um, I mean, I think I, it's something I did unconsciously as a child, um, was do other voices and um, take in different sounds in the world, but I didn't really consciously start noticing it and focusing on it until my last couple of years of high school. Um, when I started thinking about what I wanted to do with my life and, um, I know I wanted to be an actor and I was, um, told that my voice was my best quality as an actor. And so I started noticing other people's voices and their vocal storytelling because I couldn't take in physical storing as physical storytelling, excuse me, as much, obviously. Um, so I started noticing, you know, watching older actors and in my school or just on TV or film or in plays and how they use their voices to tell stories um, and how I could emulate that. To what extent do you notice your own breathing and the breathing of the other person when you're listening? Oh, tons. I mean... 
I am so hyper aware of how I talk um, because beyond being a dialect coach, I also do voiceover work. Uh, so I'm really accustomed to analyzing my voice down to tiny little breaths and, you know, pauses and um, the way I say things. So, for example, I naturally have a Midwestern American accent. But when I work with clients or I do something like this, an interview, I try to tone down the Midwestern elements of my accent to sound a little more general American. So when something Midwestern uh, pops out, it's really jarring to me because I'm so used to hearing it. So normally when I would say the phrase pops out, I would say it as pops out. But to sound more general American, I would say pops out. So I'm really hyper aware, not in a negative way where I'm judging myself or, you know, thinking, oh, that was stupid. Why would you say it like that? Um, it just is in my awareness. And, you know, a lot of people say they really hate the sound of their own voice. And I don't, you know, I mean, I have to obviously have a little bit of hubris about my voice to go into voiceover um, and think that I have a worthy voice to be heard by millions. Um and so I, I really like my voice. I'm just very aware of what I'm doing, but in more of a curious than judgmental way. And that's the same thing with other people. You know, when I'm analyzing voices, whether it's voluntarily or not, um, I'm just trying to take in everything I can not to say, oh, why does that person sound weird or that's so like wrong or incorrect that that person says something that way or you know, use this inflection or whatever it might be, you know, we're all human and imperfect. And that's what makes all of our accents and individual voices so beautiful. I'd rather listen to people with really different accents than listen to the same accent all day. What is it about other people's breathing that you notice and pay attention to that would help our audience understand a bit more about the role of breathing in listening? Um, I think how much a person consciously uses breath. Most people don't pay attention to how they breathe um, or how they're using breath. And so that's why um, I find, especially among young people today, that they go to vocal fry so much. That's that tone down here where you talk like this and you talk on that sort of grating quality of your voice. Um, usually if you're going down there, it's because you're not using enough breath to support, um, excuse me, it's a um, misconception that that tone of voice is unhealthy. It's not unhealthy unless you're squeezing your throat and like talking like this, like I have, you know, like a problem or something with like the rest of my body because I'm like tightening like my whole body to talk like this. That's really bad because I'm tightening my larynx, my, you know, my vocal tract. But if I just talk down here and um, do it in a really like open and free way, it's not unhealthy. Um, it's not going to damage my vocal cords. It's just not as pleasing to listen to. And it's also limiting in terms of how much expression of your voice you can use and how vocally committed you sound to what you're saying, which is why I think it's so popular amongst young people, because I can kind of talk down here. And if something I say is wrong, it doesn't sound as like I'm not as like committed to what I'm saying. You know what I mean? Um, so being really aware of how much breath you need and how much breath you're using and taking a full breath before you start to say something um, is really important. It's human nature to maybe on your last word or two to go into that vocal fry because we don't always know how much we're going to say or how much breath we need. But you obviously need some amount of breath. And a lot of people just don't even breathe before they start talking because a lot of people uh, have a fear of speaking. They don't like their voice or they don't like talking in large groups if that's a situation. And there's actually studies done that say more people are afraid of public speaking than dying. Um, so I think when people have to speak in certain situations, they stop breathing um, because of fear and nerves. Deep listening. Deep listening. Kipuntiki. Deep listening. Sure. In your professional work as a voice coach, what are you listening for 
what are you noticing to help your clients Mm -hmm. become more effective in what they come to you for? So the majority of people who come to me are actors who need to learn an accent or a specific role, whether it be an audition or a callback or an actual role in a you know full length show that they're going to be performing in. Um, and if they're coming to me privately, then for some reason the show doesn't have a dialect coach or I'm the dialect coach on the show and I'm working with them as you know the actors in my show. For that, um, there's a few things I really strive for. Um, One is authenticity in the accent, and that's on me. So that's me doing research and doing as much work as I can to provide the actors um, as much information as possible about how to do the accent in its most authentic form. Then there's also comprehension, because we have to understand that they are actors on stage and have to be understood. So certain accents, like a deep Cockney accent or a really strong, you know, accent from Glasgow is hard for an American audience to understand. So then we have to find the places where we soften the accent for comprehension. And then there's also the acting. A lot of times I, you know, when I watch movies or TV shows or plays, the accent often seems like a layer on top of the rest of the acting and isn't integrated. So I really make sure from the first moment I start working with an actor, the accent is tied to the character and the choices that they're making for um, that character and how the accent influences those choices. So, for example, um, some accents have a really staccato rhythm to them when they're speaking that they don't the accent doesn't sort of flow words together. Um, They sort of separate out their words more. So, for example, I just taught a Pakistani accent, and that accent has a lot of staccato um, rhythm to their speech. So when I'm working with the actors, I have to say, now for you, in this moment, you as the actor in your natural voice might kind of slur your words together or kind of mumble the line to get your point across or make it a throwaway line. But in this act, you don't have that option. They wouldn't talk like that. So it's combining all of those elements, authenticity, comprehension, and the acting choices that are available to them and how the acting and accent can work together. So when I teach the accent, I go through a breakdown and I talk about the placement, meaning where the accent lives in the mouth, the oral posture, how the different articulators, lips, tongue, teeth, how the jaw works in this accent to shape sound. The specific sound changes. So like I was talking about before, how I say so and how Oscar says so, those differences. And then the rhythm and intonation and stress pattern of the accent. And then as we go through the show or I work with the actor in their session, I pay attention and give notes on those elements and how they're contributing to or hindering the comprehension and the acting. The other type of client that comes to me are not actors who are coming to me to uh, gain a more general American sound for whatever reason. Maybe they are from a foreign country and have a really strong foreign accent and find in their lives that people have a hard time understanding them. Or perhaps they work in business and they find the accent is a barrier to relating to uh, clients. Or perhaps they're a lawyer and find that the accent is a barrier to appealing to a jury. Things like that. They come to me for all different reasons. And then I go through and teach them how to do the general American accent. I never teach it as a fix or a correction because every accent is perfect. Uh, I teach it as an option. This is an optional way to talk that you can turn off and on when you want. And that is a much longer process that takes six to 12 weeks, depending on the client, where we go through all of the different elements of the accent and do a lot of practice, both with text that I provide and spontaneous speech, because for most of these people, they want to be able to do this accent without planning what they're going to say. And so that's truly mastering the accent. Is there a story that would bring that to life, kind of the before and after with a particular Mm -hmm. actor you worked with um, through a particular part in a particular play that they had to play a particular Mm -hmm. role? Sure. So in the play I was um, talking about where there are Pakistani accents, there's also one character doing a West London accent. Um, 
this is one of the most common accents I teach is a London accent, no matter what part of London, um, because there's so many plays. I usually work on plays um, or stories that take place um, in that city that Americans want to put on. <laughs> um, and so um, when I'm teaching a London accent, the first thing I talk about is the fact that the placement is really forward. And there's lots of lip rounding. So in, like in an American accent, I just say are and they say all, tall, talk, coffee, um, things like that. And then uh, in terms of sound changes, there's something like that, the all. Then there's also the fact that they drop their what are called post vocalic R's, R's after a vowel. So they don't say car, they say car. So I talk through all that. Well, those different changes and then the fact that the rhythm, they um, elongate their words more than an American would. And the actor I'm working with is American, um, has an American accent. And they uh, have a bit more of a pitch range than Americans do. Americans generally use like three pitches, three or four pitches, not very vocally expresses, expressive, excuse me. But in a London accent, you have a bit more of a range. So the thing with London is they also drop a lot of T sounds, like I just did there, a lot of T, a lot of, instead of a lot of, or a lot of, as I would say in my American accent with a D, a lot of, a lot of. And this actor had an issue with those T sounds where instead of doing that kind of a lot of sound, that little uh, uh, which is called a glottal stop, that little uh, Sound, he would just drop the T all together. So instead of love, he'd say a love, a love, and it'd be really hard to understand what he was saying, and he would do that all the time. So I had to work with him on finding a way to drop the T's, but put in that uh sound so that he could be understood. And then in some places, just actually putting in the T, because perhaps it was um, information that was really important to the plot that we had to make sure the audience understood, or it was just a difficult sentence. Um, like he has the phrase private analyst reports, and he would say a lot, private analyst report, which is like, what are you saying? So I got him to say it like private analyst reports. And he put the T on private just to make it a bit more clear. Um, and so yeah, so the show opens tomorrow and he's a lot better now than he was at the beginning, but that was a big thing I had to work with him on was um, finding that authenticity of dropping lots of T's and it having um, kind of a looser, casual feeling to the accent, but also having the comprehension. And then also finding the ways um, and places when perhaps the actor would want to use a T for emphasis, like, um, you know, if he was saying what in a really angry manner, he wouldn't just say what, he would go what, like what are you talking about, you know? Um, if it really fit the moment. For those of you not able to watch Sammy on the podcast, the facial expressions and her intensity changed dramatically <laughs> when she moved from her uh, Midwest accent <laughs> into her London accent. The the concentration on her face and the, her range in her lip movement and the energy in her jaw was very noticeably different. And I just wanted to share that with you because you wouldn't have the opportunity to see that. If we if we change gears, though, Sammy, mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the stochastic and the Pakistani. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how would you take us quickly through that as a contrast, as an example well, on the this Pakistani one? Pakistani accent. So part of the, doing the Pakistani accent... Um, for me is um, understanding and being aware that I am white. And so the accent's never gonna sound quite the same because of the racial difference between me and a native Pakistani person. Um, and the actors I was working with um, were of that, if they weren't actually Pakistani, they were Indian or something of a similar um, ethnic background. And so there's that level of authenticity that um, we have to be aware of, but with, in that, obviously I can teach the accent, but I would never personally get on stage and perform it. But if I were teaching it, a big thing we have to focus on is the tongue position. So in my accent, the tip of my tongue to make a lot of my consonants sits on my gum ridge. So that's the place right above the top teeth, that kind of gummy place. 
And that's where I make t, d, n, l, t, t, n, l sounds. But in a Pakistani accent, you want to roll the tongue back and the tongue tip lives further back. So instead of being on the gum ridge, it's in that place kind of in between the gum ridge and where you get into the hard palate, that hard dome of your mouth. So you literally have to roll back your tongue and there's a bit more tightness in the jaw. And this is what I was talking about with the staccato rhythm. So I would maybe say, what do you think? And they would say, what do you think? What do you think? Um, where they really hit every consonant. And what you want to watch is the pitch range, because this is a very similar placement to an Indian accent. And when you start to do the Indian, that's when they get really, they get more pitchy and they get a bit more nasal sometimes. That's a huge generalization. That's a really big difference between an Indian and a Pakistani accent. The Pakistani accent has less of a pitch range and a little more uh, restrained in that way. Um, and so when we were talking about um, the characters, there's two characters who do a Pakistani accent. One is not comfortable with English and speaks with a lot of grammar mistakes um, because he's not terribly fluent. And so his accent's really, really thick. So he did kind of what I was doing there, maybe even a little thicker. And then another character, it says in his description that he's very articulate articulate with a pronounced Pakistani accent. So for him, uh, we wanted to have a slightly lighter accent. So what I did was I allowed him to have a little more jaw movement, but still had the tongue placement because allowing the jaw movement allowed it, the accent to be a little more open and a little more expressive and allowed him to play with his language more, but he still had to have that rolled back tongue position, which affected the T, D, N, L, R, um, lots of consonant sounds. Deep listening. Écoute attentive. Bene ascoltare. Ukulalela fieleja. What are the things that you think make a really big difference to listening beyond the words mm -hmm. to help people understand the meaning of what someone's trying to communicate? Mm -hmm. I think trying to notice beyond um, content, but trying to notice um, feeling and emotion um, behind what they are saying, so how they're saying it, not in terms of necessarily their accent, but the emotion behind the words. I think a lot of people, especially sighted people, depend on seeing a face. Um, to read emotion or body language. Um, and in my life, I don't have that option. So I pick up a lot of um, someone's emotions from how they're using their voice. And that doesn't mean, you know, oh, is the person crying? Obviously, they're sad. Is the person yelling? Obviously, they're mad. Those are obvious to anyone because they're extremes. But for example, if I tend to always kind of drop down in tone, when I'm talking like this, so I start high and then kind of go low all the time in a conversation, and maybe that's not what I normally do, that probably means I'm maybe sad or depressed or just down for some reason. Or if I'm doing the opposite and I'm lifting a lot, you know, even if I'm not smiling, I'm just like, you know, lifting a lot in what I'm saying. Maybe I'm really happy or maybe I'm even really nervous if I'm doing it incessantly and I'm doing it really fast. Um, Noticing things like that. So trying to go beyond extremes of emotional representation in the voice and really reading into um, how people use their pitch and their volume um, in, in trying to either express or even hide their emotions. A lot of people try to use their voice to hide their emotions. They go, no, I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine. I'm really fine, right? But you can hear, even though I'm saying I'm fine, my voice is kind of like, quavering a little, right? That means I'm absolutely not fine. <laughs> There's definitely something wrong. Do you, do you have an example where somebody has listened completely to your meaning or completely misunderstood your meaning when they've been listening to you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I deal with um, a lot of people of different age groups because in theatre, you know, you can be any age and work as an actor. And so, especially in the early part of my career, which I mean, I'm still technically in because <laughs> I'm only 27, but in the very early part of my career, when I was say 22 or 23, anytime I would have to work with a 
middle-aged man, usually white. Uh, I could tell that they were not taking in what I had to say and just listening to sort of make me feel better and make me feel like I mattered when, you know, they didn't really think so. So they would come and think that they already knew how to do the accent I was teaching them and would just kind of sit there to um, appease me and all that. And I could just, I could feel in the room that they weren't listening because they would sort of cut off what I had to say, not let me finish my full sentence. Or every time I would say something, they'd be like, yeah, mm -hmm, I know. Something dismissive like that. And then oftentimes they were the worst one in the show. Have you, have you got an, an example of a, of a real situation without giving away names there of actually how that played out? Yeah. So, um, a show I worked on, um, I had to teach an older male actor, a Yorkshire accent. Um, and he, I'm going to say he was 50 or 60. And at that time I was 24 and he came in and I said, Oh, have you done a Yorkshire accent before? He said, no, but I mean, I know how to do it. And I said, okay, great. Because I like to know an actor's background, if they've done it before, if I need to spell it out a little more for them, you know, just where the, where the actor's at with the accent. And, uh, I still taught him the accent and I sort of had to pull tooth and nail to get him to do my exercises. So, you know, part of when we're going over the sound changes, I'll say, okay, I'm going to say the sound first. And then you repeat it after me. So I say, go. Cool. And then he, I'd say, okay, now you say it. And he'd say, oh, okay, cool. And then every time we would have to do that. Um, anytime I wanted him to say a word and then he, uh, was in the show and he was not great. Um, he kept keeping his post vocalic R sounds, which in a Yorkshire accent, you don't, you drop your ending R sounds as it were. And, uh, he would not listen to my notes. So pretty much what he did on day one was the way he sounded when the show opened, the show extended a number of times and he could only do the regular one of the show. So they brought in a new actor. I worked with this new actor for one day who was great, very open to listening. And he did the accent perfectly the next day. Um, and just got, what do you think the second actor was doing differently in their listening compared to the first? Um, and they were of similar ages. I mean, I would say he came in with an open mind to what I had to teach because even if I have an actor who's done an accent a bunch of times that I'm ready and I need to teach it to them, I'll say, okay, great. But maybe we're doing it slightly differently for this show. Maybe we're focusing on different elements or maybe it's a different time period. Time period plays a huge role in how an accent sounds um, or just the circumstances of the character. You know, is the character maybe less educated than the previous character they played who did that accent? And so I think this new actor was more open to hearing the specifics I had to offer um, and how it could help shape this specific character for him. If you were to leave our audience with a final tip on how to listen better, what would that be? Be open-minded and op open-hearted. Hearing what someone's saying doesn't always mean you're taking it in past your ears, you know, that you're taking it into your heart and mind and consciousness. Um, but that, you know, so you're listening beyond the surface of what they're saying, but listening to how they're saying it and why they're saying it and what it means to you and how maybe what they're saying can change you or affect you. Um, because I think every interaction we have changes us in some way, whether it's big or almost indetectable. You know, we're always growing and changing. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. What a powerful gift Sammy has to share with the world. Despite the fact she's unable to see out of one of her eyes and got very narrow vision in the other, her gift of powerful listening is transforming the way actors and others are bringing their presence to the world. She's changing the way lawyers engage with juries. She's changing the way business people engage with their customers. Sammy's ability to teach me today to focus very carefully on listening to what's meant rather than just what's said was really powerful. And the other lesson I took away was 
listening across the generations, going back into that dinner table conversation with passionate and active debate between Sammy, her family, particularly her dad, who held very different views to her, but Sammy having the presence to be able to listen completely and without judgment to him was really powerful. So the question I've got for you today as you listen to others, is when somebody creates a different perspective while you're listening to them, are you immediately jumping into judgment and thinking why they're wrong? Or will you bring the full power and gift that Sammy brings and completely listen to what they say without judgment and understand not just what they're saying, understand how they're saying it, and finally why they're saying it, which is the meaning behind what they're saying. Are you listening completely to the meaning or are you just staying in judgment because the opinion is different to yours? If you want to become a great listener, listen for meaning. Thanks for listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Lourdes LaSalle. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Impact beyond words. Sammy, just educate me. Talk talk me through what's happened to your site. Yeah, so my main issue is glaucoma, um, which is degenerative. So I've always been visually impaired. That's always been part of my identity for as long as I can remember. Um, But I have had much more sight than I do now. And right now I'm not completely blind, but it is very possible that I will um, become completely blind at some point in my life. An amazing ophthalmologist who works hard to stabilize the vision I have, um, but there's only so much current medicine can do. Um, And I have other minor issues in addition to the glaucoma that make it so my eye treatment is not a sort of an easy one-stop shop pill fix, um, but sort of, you know, combinations of medications and different procedures and surgeries to try to maintain the vision that I have. Um, but that's been the main issue is glaucoma. So, um, when I was younger, I could, uh, read regular size print and I didn't use a cane. Um, but I had issues seeing far away and issues seeing some level of detail. Now at 27, I have to use a cane to get around. I don't use it in my apartment or in my parents' house or other places I'm very familiar with, but to get around in my everyday life, I use it. Um, and I can't read print at all, no matter what size, um, unless I use um, a piece of machinery called a CCTV, which um, I put papers under a camera and in the largest type on a screen. And that's how I can read. But I read three times slower than the average person. So reading with my eyes is really limited to reading my mail, writing out a check, um, you know, sort of just basic life necessities. But if I were to read a book, I would use an audio book. And in terms of what I actually can see, um, it's just way less detail than I could even see as a kid. Um, and that is what continues to decrease. And I have no peripheral vision, um, only center vision. And the center vision I have is very limited. And that's only in the left eye. The right eye is completely blind um, because my retina detached when I was five in that eye. So that eye has been completely blind almost my whole life. So that's kind of the long <laughs> version of it. Scotland would be dip listening. And then say in Northern English would be more deep listening. London would be deep listening. Um, and then a more refined lens would be more, full, more refined, excuse me, would be deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Lourdes LaSalle. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Impact beyond words.